Hi, welcome to Nothing Venture, Nothing Game. As always, I'm your host with the most, your GM Jared. And today, Gamer Gang, I want to talk to you about Monsters in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Now, I know a lot of people have been kind of dipping their toes into other editions, maybe coming from different sources, maybe coming from 5th Edition. And I want to just talk to you about some basic monsters and how they work. Uh, Cause you're gonna be coming from another system into Pathfinder second edition. You're gonna see a lot of things. You're gonna see tags. You're gonna see weird symbols like try, like diamonds, um, a weird like Nike swoosh on its side. That's the only way that like I understand it. Uh, what is weakness? What is uh, immunity? How does that all work together while your players are playing and while you're GMing? So I'm gonna try and break this down. We're gonna start with a few low level monsters, take this nice and slow and then in the next video, we're gonna work on high level monsters, spell casting with monsters, and how everything kind of plays together. So it's gonna be two parts. This part is for brand new GMs getting into Pathfinder second edition and monsters. So if you're coming over from another edition, appreciate it. Thank you for checking out Pathfinder second edition. I like it, I love it, it's really fun. Hopefully your players and you as a GM like it and love it also. Uh, with that being said, if you can do me the solid, you gotta hit the button, you know, do the doobly doos with the button, you gotta hit the like and subscribe because it raises my viewer count and then allows me to reach more people and do this really cool thing that I like doing. Uh, and hopefully everyone out there likes me doing this too. But with that being said, give me a moment as I leave my wizard's uh, sanctuary and head over to the monster sanctuary. So stick around and I'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. So I've blown up a big image of this is from Archive of Nethys. It's a great tool if you're kind of coming into Pathfinder Second Edition. It's a lot of information out there that's kind of compiled into one area. So what we're looking at today, uh, firstly, is a CR minus one, right? So this is the stuff you're going to be. It's a Goblin Warrior. It's going to be stuff you're going to be basically seeing and dealing with at early levels, like the levels one, two, and three. Uh, even like up to four. You're going to be dealing with a bunch of these. You want to kind of get them all together. Now, first things first, you're going to see over here, right over here, up there, you see Goblin Warrior, you see Elite, Normal, and Weak. Basically, what happens is um, if you're here on this site and you're trying to come up with a harder monster, if you hit Elite, it gets stronger. And if you hit Weak, it does get weaker. So I'm going to hit uh, Elite right now, and it's going to load. And so it says changes uh, from being elite are marked in red, the plus two damage. So it gives damage, right? So that's kind of what happens here. And then we're going to scroll down and you're going to see everything that's popping up in red is what's been added. So it has a plus 10 to hit. Uh, uh, it's a D6 plus two. It raised the AC, raised the hit points uh, and raised all your saves. So. First things first, that's what changes if you hit the buttons. I just want to show you what's going on with Archive Nethys. Now let's jump back into the monsters. So I'm just going to make this a normal monster again. Back to the normal monster. So Pathfinder 2nd Edition does lots of things that your players can do while fighting monsters besides just hitting the monster. So one of the most important things, and, and it comes up very frequently in chats and in conversations, is what can I do with my three actions? Remember, all players have three actions and all monsters have the reactions they can do on their turn. So just be careful with that. Um, and keep that in the back of your head as you're planning out your encounters and even running your encounters. Now, top thing firstly is players can use a action called recall knowledge. Now it's an action, some classes change it um, and some classes make it a free if you do something else. Um, I know fighters have a ability where they can swing and hit on a monster. And if they hit, they can make a free recall knowledge action. When you're recalling knowledge, you'll see right here in this space right here, it will give you how, what skill to use. So if you're using society, the DC check, so the number they have to roll, if they are trained in society is a 13. If they are using an unspecified lore, like let's say I, uh, um, like I'm not trained in, in society, uh, it's it's a little easier, and then a specific lore makes it super uh, easy. And if they're using society to know about this goblin, like maybe they want to know um, what languages do, does this goblin speak? Uh, 
kind of like what its AC might be, what kind of does it have attack of opportunities? Because in Pathfinder Second Edition, not all monsters and not all players have attack of opportunities. But additionally, monsters not all monsters have attack of opportunity. So that's a big change coming from other editions, such as 3.5, if you're old school players, Pathfinder First Edition, or even Fifth Edition, Dungeons and Dragons. So that is a specified recall knowledge. I want to know if this monster has an attack of opportunity, making a recall knowledge check. I got a higher than a 13, the GM can rule it. Now, a specific lore is like, hey. I know goblin lore. I'm actually playing a goblin because in Pathfinder Second Edition, goblins can, uh, you goblins a playable uh, ancestry, so you can be like, I'm a goblin. Do I do do I know goblin fighters have attack of opportunities? Can I roll? Uh, you roll, and it's it's much easier because you're such like so. Then you might have an easier chance. Obviously, depending on the monster. Your players, maybe goblins, are super rare in your universe, and the players have never seen goblins. These DCs can be adjusted for the monster variety type this is just something very basic moving on down you come to the goblin warrior basically it tells you uh its basic alignment is chaotic evil its size is small it's goblin and it's a humanoid those are all important especially for spells certain spells uh perception has plus two and dark vision uh languages it only speaks goblin uh skills it's trained clearly trained these are the trained skills so it's trained in stealth, nature, athletics, and acrobatics. So if it's making a religion check for some reason, uh, it's not trained in that. Uh, items, that's the standard items that you get. AC, obviously we've all played the armor class is 16. Fort, reflex, and will are all different saves, usually based on magic or specific types of attack. Like if I'm trying to trip an enemy, I have to... They, I have to roll higher. I have to, my athletics check has to be higher than their fortitude save. Their fortitude save is 10 plus their fort number. Uh, so in this, it would be 10 plus five. So it's a 15. So I have to roll higher than the 15 to see if I'm able to trip, trip the goblin. Next is its hit points. It only has six hit points. Obviously, that's up to you. You could say all goblins in your universe have 10, uh, but that's homebrewing stuff. This is just a book as rules is written. Now, this is important. If you remember before, I said not all monsters have attack of opportunities as reaction. Right here, we have the goblin uh, scuttle. It's a reaction. Your monsters only get one reaction per turn, similar to players. Um, things change, obviously, as you go. But in this case, monsters only have one reaction. Once they use their reaction, they have to wait till the, the start of their next turn to recover a new act reaction. Uh, so the trigger a goblin ally ends a move action adjacent to the warrior affect the goblin warrior steps so uh, to understand this to break it down uh, if let's say th there's a secondary goblin that moves next to uh, ends a move action adjacent to the goblin warrior right this one then can take a step <laughs> what a step is is a action that does not trigger a reaction. So if the fighter is specifically fighting this goblin and its goblin buddy kind of comes up and ends right behind, adjacent to it, that goblin that's fighting the fire can step away from the fighter without triggering the fighter's attack of opportunity. Uh, the base speed for goblins is 25 feet. Remember, uh, if you, again, if you're using a grid system and all in your situation, all the, the, the squares are five feet, that's how far it moves. Uh, melee, it's a single action, and ranged short bow to attack is a single action. And you see these breakdown of these numbers. So it has dog sir plus eight, plus four, plus zero. When you roll your two hit on your first attack action, it's plus eight. On your second attack action, because in Pathfinder Second Edition, you have something called map or multiple attack penalty. Um Normally it's five, it's minus five and minus 10. If you have the agile trait on your weapon, and that's what this weapon has, it is a minus, it's a lower. So it's uh, it's lowered. So this goes from eight to four because it's a minus four and not a minus five. It would be a plus three if it was a plus five. And then it's a minus eight. So if it already has a plus eight, it's just at a minus eight. So it's at a plus zero, flat plus zero. It's damaged because the goblin does not have a bonus to strength. It's only a D6 plus slashing. 
So you'll notice some differences here. First off, the agile trait allows you to make more attacks at a higher chance to hit. Backstabber does deal a single point of precision damage to a flat-footed creature. Flat-footed creatures are creatures that haven't acted in uh, since the beginning of the round, right? So initiative is called if you haven't acted, you're flat-footed, or if you're flanked by enemies. Again, in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, flanking is a standard rule. Um, and Finesse. What does Finesse do? Finesse allows you to use your dexterity modifiers to your hit. Not to your damage. So, short bow, it's plus eight, plus three, and a minus two. Unlike the dog slicer, which has agile, the short bow does not. The reload, zero, meaning it doesn't take any actions to reload this weapon. Range, uh, 60 feet. So, if you are at 60 feet, you can, uh, it can hit you. Deadly D10. Now, this is important. For especially for players and for GMs to, to recognize this. And this can change the flow of combat very quickly. What happens with the deadly is if there is a critical hit, the goblin would roll 2d6 and then add a d10 to that roll. Doesn't double the d10. It just adds it to the critical hit roll. So again, you double all dice, excluding the deadly dice. So, again, the goblin rolled a natural 20, or roll 10 over the fighter's armor class, right? Those are two ways in Pathfinder 2nd Edition a monster or a player may crit. Additionally, if they roll 10 under and a natural 1, that is a critical failure. So, 10 over or a natural 20, and 10 under or a natural 1 results in criticals on both ends of the spectrum. Now... Uh, that's how deadly range increment. So again, outside the range increment, you start to incur negative penalties to your rolls to hit. Um, again, they have that minus two on that last attack. So a lot of times they might want to move to a better position on your last roll, but that's up to you as to how you want to play that. So that's a basic goblin encounter. That's what we're looking at, basic goblin stuff. Now I'm going to move over to another type of monster that you'll probably see very early on. Now you have your wolf. Um, obviously, there are multiple different types of wolves. They give you a little bit of information at the very bottom about wolves uh, on Archives of Nethys. They do that again for goblins also. So if you're reading about goblins off Archives of Nethys, you have that opportunity to read more on that. So if we scroll up a little here, they talk, you know, wolves hunt, live in hunting packs, you know, your basic wolf stuff. Again, recall knowledge. This is animal. Animal falls into the nature. If you're trained, it's a 15. Unspecified lore, like uh, maybe you're from the city, right? Like I live in New York City. I've never seen a wolf. I understand they're just big puppies. In my head, it's like a Rottweiler. If I've ever seen a wolf in the wild, as I've been told, they're much bigger than dogs. Uh, and they look aggressively different. Now, my my understanding is I don't know much about wolves. So I'm going to base it off of a dog. That's that unspecified lore. It's lower, but I'm going to not get specific information. I'm going to maybe get stuff like, oh, uh, you know, like climb a tree. Dogs aren't really good at climbing trees. So a wolf probably can't climb a tree and get you. Stuff like that. That's what it does. Specific lore, let's say maybe I'm uh, a druid or I, uh, I'm i animal trainer background and I have like lore wolves or or something of that nature. Uh, it's much easier and I'll get more information. So that's all the same. That's that recall knowledge check. That's an important one. I can't stress it enough, especially with your players. Recall knowledge can change the course of a fight very quickly. Your players are losing. That one player makes that check and suddenly re gets a, a burst of inspiration or finds out something that happens be uh, because of an attack. And this is a good one to show that. So again, neutral, medium, Base animals, you have your perception, they have low light vision, scent imprecise, up to 30 feet. Um, low light vision, dark vision, you know, it's it's kind of how things are are seen. Um, I'm not gonna get into the visions. Um actually it is based on this is more of a GM information, but like low light and imprecise scent are two things that are important if you're using perception checks 
or if someone's hiding or hidden. Um, skills, again, they're athletics, acrobatics, stealth, and survival. They're all trained in. Um, and then you see their intelligence is a minus four. Their con is a plus one. Charisma is a minus two. Um, and then you have your AC. Again, your fortitude, reflex, and will save. Here you see the will save is a little lower. So that's something a player might get on a recall knowledge check. Like, And now the caster realizes, oh, I could dominate this monster or this animal. I could cast dominate animal or, or I could cast you know, control animal or maybe uh, another spell that hits its will save. And it's easier for me to hit that because I've been trying to trip this wolf this whole time and it's, uh, its fortitude save is fairly high uh trip is based off of its reflex and not its fortitude I, sorry i was i've been getting them backwards this whole time in my head but again if if the fighter's been trying to trip the wolf it's got that plus nine so it's a 19 save it's a fairly high number especially at early levels now melee the draws are plus nine plus four and plus one and they have this thing it says plus knockdown now how does that work now if you were to read this you would you would say oh well instantaneously the wolf knocks down the player. That is not true, but also true. Now it says plus knockdown. It's so right. Like I said, you think it's going to knock down instantaneously? Not yes and no. Now it's important to know. Let's say you rolled really bad. So the first time you rolled a seven plus nine, you didn't hit the fighter. Second time you rolled a four plus four, you didn't hit the fighter. Right. Next time you rolled a 19 minus one, 18, you hit the fighter's armor class and you hit. Now it's the third action, right? That was three actions. It says piercing 1d6 plus two plus knockdown. So in your head, you're like, oh, I knocked down the creep, knocked down the player because it instantly, the way it's written, it lends itself to say plus knockdown, right? Knockdown is a monster ability. Now, let me switch this over so you understand what I'm looking at here. So, boom, flipping it over. Now, requirements. The monster's last action was a successful strike that lists knockdowns in its damage effect. The monster knocks the target prone. So, yes, it does knock the player down. But here's the caveat. It's a single action. You see that little symbol, that, that triangle, that diamond? That means it's an action. So, since the wolf used three actions already, the wolf does hit but it cannot take the knockdown action because it needs that last action. Now, this is super important because a few times when I was learning Pathfinder 2nd Edition, right when it came out, coming off of the beta test, I was playing Wolves that they instantly knocked you down, and that made Wolves aggressively hard and dangerous at higher levels. My rules arbiter Steve was like, yo, you're playing Wolves wrong as the GM. And let me explain to you how knockdown works. I re-looked at knockdown. I was like, oh my God. Yeah, that last encounter that almost TPK'd the party shouldn't have been went that way. Helps to know. So that's important. You can look up these effects um, and understand that some of them happen, but they usually do take an action. And that's how Pathfinder 2nd Edition balanced many of its monster abilities. It's based on actions. Now, continuing forward, I just wanted to show that because I wanted to show Wolves because Wolves has that built into them. Now, the reason why that's important is because Wolves have pack attack. The Wolf Strike deals an extra D4 damage to creatures within range of its allies. So Wolves basically gang up. Hopefully, they attack. The first attack, because it has that plus 9, you're hoping to roll like a 12 or 13. Plus 9, you're hitting the low-level... Uh, players out armor class you next action you take that knockdown um which eats up an action and then uh the map is still a minus one but because they're knocked prone their armor class is uh reduced and the other wolves can gang up and like attack the prone creature that has the um the action uh that that has to take an action on its turn to stand up also, as you see on the wolf, there is no reactions. This wolf has no reaction. So if a player is standing next to a wolf, the player does not need to take the step action to move away from the wolf. The player can then just move away from the wolves and the wolf does not have an attack of opportunity. So those were two different creatures, one showing attack of opportunities and the second showing monster ability 
that you might see pop up. So just trying to show you how attack of opportunities work and how monster abilities work. Now we're gonna move on to yet another low level monster. This one I'm, I think is really important. We're gonna look at the Quasit. Uh, this is a demon, it's a CR1, but it's tiny. You might be fighting demons. Demons are fun to throw at your players because they're just demons and who doesn't like just smashing demons. Also, they seem like as a new player, when you fight a demon at early levels, you're like, oh, I'm actually a, a, a hero because I've, or like a, a, this like epic person because I've fought a demon, right? Demons always like, you think Balrog and then you're fighting a Quasit. Not the same, but it's important. Now, again, recall knowledge. This one's a fiend. So it's based on religion. I'm not gonna go over that, um, but you could see the difference all there. Now this one's a little different because it is tiny. So tiny requires for the monster to make an attack to be to be in the same square as the player, not the square in front of it, right? Uh, so if you're playing on a grid, the tiny creature has to be in the same square as the uh, creature it's attacking. Um, they have to occupy the same square. Only tiny creatures can do this. If this was small, it, it can still stay on the outside of the, um, it gets that five foot square. So that's how tiny works. So that's an important thing to know as a GM. The reason why I wanted to uh, bring up the closet is it has a really cool, it has a lot of stuff. Uh, has weaknesses and a monster aversion. Uh, so vampires have this. It's really cool. It, it adds a lot more to the to the monsters, especially when a player is going to make that recall knowledge check. You could be like, hey, you know the monster's weakness is cold iron as well as good base damage. Now, what does that do? Well, when a monster is struck with a cold iron sword, or some kind of holy good damage, it gets a, it takes an additional three points of damage of that type. So if the Quasit is struck with a uh, cold iron arrow and you deal two points of piercing damage, you will also deal three points of cold iron damage. Here, this is important because we're kind of working into spells how do spells work and all that jazz uh, moving down you see again it has oh, so quasits are great because they they give you so much so claw it's agile it's evil so that's important because if a player is evil if someone's playing a lawful evil paladin or uh what do they call them uh tyrants or something uh a champion is the name of the class, but the subclass that you would play is something different. But so let's say someone's playing a lawful evil character. Uh, the attack is evil and it will deal no damage to that player. Um, it is finesse. So again, uh, it can deal a two hit is via dex. Uh, it's magical. So if you have some kind of defenses against like, um, like a rage or something like that, this is magical. Uh, and it also does poison. And that means the attack has the poison trait and it does deal poison. We'll get into poisons in a moment. Um, but see, it does a D6, uh, minus one slashing, plus a D4 evil. The slashing you still take, but the evil you do not if you are that lawful evil creature. Now, if you're hitting a a good aligned creature, you will still take, uh, you will take that D4 evil damage. I believe neutral, you do not. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty much sure you do not take it on neutral. I think neutral is the like the, the, the best way out of that, that situation. Uh, you have your innate spell casting. So the DC save is 17. So they give it to you right away. Uh, they have read omens, detect alignment at will, good only. So that's important because it can detect alignment at will, meaning... Um, yeah, it just, it can, it could, I mean, it's similar to like 5th edition. It could just do it at its will. It still needs to take the action, um, but it's an at will ability. Uh, and it can only detect good alignments. So if you're neutral, it's like, I don't detect you. And if you're evil, it doesn't detect you. Invisibility, it's self only. Can't give it to someone else. 
um, fear. It has a first level spell fear and cantrips. It's first level. Uh, detect uh, magic. So that's all it has. So um, those are its spells. Uh, Bissell healing. This is important. It's an action. Frequency once per round. The effect the quasit restores D6 hit points to itself. Chain shape. This one is a little different. This is a polymorph transmutation concentration. So how does this work? Well, basically, again, the concentrate, it changes shape. It spends an action to turn into a different kind of creature. So it can turn into a bat and it gets all that bat abilities. It can turn into a wolf and get all those wolves abilities. He has that knockdown. Again, let's say you're playing a quasit and playing with a quasit. You didn't know what knockdown was. Now you know what knockdown is because you saw this video. And that's pretty awesome of you. Continually going. We're now all the way down. All the way down to... Quasit Venom, the poison. How does this work? Um, poisons are a long topic. Uh, I could do a whole video on poisons. I'm not. The quick and dirty is on your turn, the player who is struck has to make the save, right? They're struck. They make the save. They fail the save. They don't roll high enough. They're DC 17. Remember, you have that fortitude number. You roll fortitude. You do not pass the save. Stage one. D6 poison, one round. Next, so this, the maximum duration are six rounds. This can continue. Next turn, you know, they make that save again, they fail. It now goes to stage two and continues all the way down to stage, uh, all the way, all the way down to its last and final stage. Um, so you get slowed for a round at stage three. Um, so I see a stage one. Stage three is D6, slowed for a round, and it stays like that. You're now stuck. You're D6 poison, and you're continually slowed one for one round, all the way to maximum duration of six rounds. So that that's it. You just got to deal with it for six rounds. Hopefully, you make that save sooner or later, or someone can aid you in that save in some fashion. Um, and that's how, again, there was a lot in, in the closet, but I really wanted to talk about how weakness works again Weakness works is if you're struck striking the enemy with that specific weapon type, it takes additional damage. Um, if again, this is evil, does that plus e D4 evil? If your creature is neutral or evil, you do not take that D4. So that's important to know. You might be playing with a chaotic neutral character. Uh, alignment in Pathfinder Second Edition, like with everything else, is up to you how to play it. But just understand. Um, Sometimes it comes up in these weird situations, especially if you're dealing with creatures like this. Now, I've jumped back into my humble abode, and I really hope you enjoyed this video. I know I went over a lot, so take your time. Listen to it. Maybe you're confused about certain things. If you're confused, have questions about, like, your new GM coming to uh, Petfinder 2nd Edition from other editions, and you have questions, please drop us in the comments below ask your questions we'll try and get to them myself or rules arbiter steve he'll hop in there and answer your questions he's better with these rules than i am um but i i just wanted to show you there's a lot going on here but it's not a lot there's there's it's i know i probably overwhelmed you and i hope i didn't scare you off with this video but i just want to show and kind of give a breakdown of what monsters are like in pathfinder second edition there's a lot going on and Sometimes, you know, you kind of have to prep these monsters a little bit in advance when you're playing them because they have so much happening, you know, um, unlike other systems out there where maybe monsters only have like one or two things that they can do. Most of the time, monsters in Pathfinder 2nd Edition have multiple things happening. And sometimes you're almost playing a, a, a like almost a character like creature. Remember the Quasit, it it has a a a past history that you could bring up in your role play, you know, just information with these character with these monsters. This does seem to be a lot, right? Like the tiny thing, quasi being tiny. Well, if a spider is tiny, it has to be in the player's square, it has to be occupying the same space as the player to attack. Now, that's only if you're using the the grid, right? Like if you're using theater of the mind, players understand, right? Most of us have that common understanding that, like, yeah, the spider ran up. Bit me on the foot. 
occupying the same square as me. Um, you know, on top of that, can players attack that monster? Yes, they can. Um, it's it's it, it, there's no uh, you don't have to worry about hitting hitting the the player. Uh, that's how most people play it. You don't have to worry about hitting the player. Um, you know, how's flanking work and such? That's all important questions. Uh, rules kind of show it up. You know, if you if you have a rogue, flanking's part of their their whole kit. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on with monsters. It's really cool. Monsters have a lot of flair and don't be afraid to add something to them. Maybe you want to give wolves a fear of, um, maybe all wolves are scared of a specific plant. Like they don't like the smell of pepper plants, uh, pep peppercorn, um, or maybe, and that's something you can add to your, to your lore and give your monsters more flair as you go. But yeah, so hopefully you're new, you're you're watching this video, you're like, oh cool, thanks for like showing me a little things. If you have any questions, please, please, please feel free to ask. Uh, we love answering questions. We love starting a conversation with everyone out there. And you know, again, this is this is to help everyone out there. Hopefully, we get more GMs out there because that's that would be awesome. We we need more GMs. So if you're coming from another system, thank you for coming and trying Pathfinder 2nd Edition. If you're a brand new GM and Pathfinder 2nd Edition is your first system, congratulations. You're, you're awesome. You guys are all awesome GMs already. But from all of us here at Nothing Ventured, Nothing Game, I want to say we love rolling dice, giving advice, with a little bit of that New York spice. Have a good day and keep on GMing.